so back again this week. Uh, the topic for today is going to be the nature of the Bible's revelation being closed, juxtaposed with the concept of prophecy or um, revelatory type gifts in the church as talked about in the New Testament juxtaposed with the concept of the closed canon. So it's kind of, it's a topic of revelation, but really broken into two parts. First, how the, the Bible is complete and written without things to be added to it. Second, how it also does talk about um, what at least could be interpreted as revelatory type things happening in the church under terms such as prophecy. So, uh, thank you for watching. Um, I'm not really sure w what I'm doing with this YouTube channel. I, uh, I'm making these videos. It doesn't appear that anyone's watching them. Uh, they, all the videos made so far on the topic of trying to teach the Bible have zero views, and um, I don't really know, to, to be honest with you, why I'm making them, if it has to do with my own uh, interest, like I like it, or some bizarre aspect of pride that I like to hear myself talk or want people to hear me. Um, those would be negative reasons. Maybe God's prompting me to. That could be a positive reason, but like I said, I, I don't know. Um, but I do think I enjoy it. So let's pray and ask for his help. Father God, um, I don't want to be prideful or proud or self-indulgent. I like to hear myself talk, and um, I don't know necessarily how to fight against that but I we come to you I come to you today asking for your help specifically actually for your power to be made perfect in human weakness especially in your power in opening up your word help me father God to open your word here on the internet to whoever you might bring along to listen to it and let your word speak powerfully and uh, pierce hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what about the topic of the Bible canon? I use the term canon. I would just throw that out there. Canon is used in, in the theology circles to mean what is the, um, the list of books that would be included in the Bible. And that different churches do have a different list. That they, they allow, although the core is the same, and uh, the core, is, and the, those that are not part of that same core generally are kind of viewed as a little lesser for, in the churches that do include them. But uh, that's what we mean by canon. I, I don't know why they use that word. I think it, it, it means rule, or, or the etymology is rule or standard. Uh, so it's closed. Why does why is that? It's kind of a fundamental Christian idea. Well, it comes from scriptural passages. I know that we mentioned this in the last video, but I just think it, it ought to be hashed out a little bit more clear. So there are a couple books of the Bible. Revelation actually is the book that's placed at the end of the canon in most order or in all the ordering that I'm aware of. And if you look in Revelation, the last uh, few phrases says, Revelation chapter 22, verse 19, If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things that are written in this book. So I guess I should, should read the adding. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, if anyone adds to these things, 
God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. So that 18 is forbidding adding, and 19 is forbidding taking away. Um, in its original writing, that, that referred only to this last book, but I think it's kind of clear from how the editors placed this book last that they're intending the idea to carry for the whole canon. Similar thing happens in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, which is the, the last of the first five books, which was the earliest section of scripture. That was the scripture that was used by all the ancient nation of Israel. Jesus had used that, and, and there was more books in his day, but that, that ends with a similar kind of thing about uh, not adding to and not uh, taking away from the words of, of that book. We're not going to read that because I don't know where it is. And I don't have it written in notes. But I know it's in Deuteronomy. More specifically, um, there were people during the time that the New Testament was written who were kind of given uh, a, a mandate by Jesus to write scripture. Let's look at that mandate in the Gospel of John. When Jesus is having a kind of farewell address to his disciples. He's giving this uh, to them, this idea that, that they're going to be taught things by the Holy Spirit, that they're going to be led into the, the truth. Uh, so let's just look. Uh, chapter 14, verse 26. But when the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, but the Helper, not when, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 14, 26. If you flip this to the next chapter, 15, 26 through 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And then, uh, so the Holy Spirit's testifying. They're going to testify. Just flipping forward a few bit. And this is all one dialogue. Jesus' long conversation Jesus is having with his disciples in monologue. 16, 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear, bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. Before, because I go to the Father. So this idea that this the Holy Spirit is coming. And he's going to be leading these apostles, disciples who've been with Jesus, into all truth. And, and then these are the guys who are writing the New Testament. Um, that is um, kind of, I, I mentioned that to show the mandate that they had to write Scripture. And then in their writing of Scripture, as they were prompted by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, they gave... Um, pretty clear indication that there was no more scripture that was going to be written. Um, there's a number of passages. We can start with uh, the book of Jude. We have uh, the third verse. Jude, Jude only has verses. There's no chapters. We have this mention of Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, 
I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So this idea that the teaching of this, of this Christian faith has been delivered, and it was delivered once for all, it's not going to be uh, a, a, a new revelation of it or a new iteration of it. It's once for all, and it needs to be uh, protected against uh, other or false teachers, basically. Um, and that's what most of the rest of Jude's about, is people who are falling away from this faith that was once for all delivered in the pages of Scripture. Uh, what else here? Um, I know that I read this, I believe, in the last video, but Galatians chapter 1. It's a very strong statement of how the New Testament writers maintained there wasn't going to be anything new um, after what they had written. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through them about not only to, to deliver the gospel in written form, but then to put a restriction on more to be said. So, let's see here. Um, by Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please man? For if I still please man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Very clear. No one can add, not even these apostles that the Holy Spirit was given to to write. Not even they can change what they have been, what they have preached and declared through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, not a not a supernatural being, an angel appearing. No one can change it. Um, Another passage where Paul's writing to the Thessalonians and he says that, you know, there's no no means by which it could be changed, not not, a, not in writing, not by word of mouth. Um, I don't think Galatians mentions a, a written thing, a written document, so that's why I read Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2. Uh, But I might be wrong. I think that's Second Thessalonians. Sorry, it's Second Thessalonians two. Um, Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by a spirit, so that's another supernatural being, or by word, you know, somebody coming and preaching something or by letter, um, you know, a written document, as if from us, as if from the apostles, as though the day of Christ had come. And no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Do you not, let me go down, do, I not do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So, I think that the, the written idea, a letter, uh, is kind of important because it would put a restriction on, even if, say, archaeologists or someone were to dig up or just discover a, you know, a letter from Paul or a letter from Timothy, it wouldn't, wouldn't really have grounds to be included in the canon on the basis of what's being laid out about what should what, what what is included is what should be and these other things by what other means ought not to be included um, and that's an interesting idea because um, 
there's been all kinds of challenges to this and, and many faults from the Christian perspective religions have arisen um, or angels appearing to people giving them new revelation uh, people have brought forth ancient gospels you know the Gnostic gospels for example other documents and said hey look this ought to be included but <clears throat> what I'm hoping to demonstrate here and I believe it to be true is that the New Testament itself is placing pretty strong restrictions on itself saying none of these other things written documents that were even written by us or claimed to be written by us angels appearing spirits revealing none of these things are allowed to speak with authority this is the authority uh, what else other passages um, hmm. there's a few more let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11 kind of similar thing similar idea for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy this is verse 2 for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Again, no new teaching, no different teaching, no different spirit, no different uh, Jesus is, is permitted by the text of the New Testament. Uh, what else? That's Second Corinthians 11. Oh, you got uh, First Corinthians, similar idea when he's writing about Revelation. Three. Um, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit oh, my notes popped away okay they're back all right um, so this idea that uh, Jesus is um, the Holy Spirit. No, I'm not sure why that's there. I know I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus to curse. So, so, so it's a restriction on the, on the, the uh, what, what the message can be. The message is only the message of the New Testament. What else do we have? May it be may it just be beating a dead horse at this point. One John four. I want to make the point, I'm trying to make the point pretty strong because it's an important point. I'm trying to bring up any kind of scripture that I could think of that touches on the point. You may be thinking why well, I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. I, I am. I've only made one, one, tried to make one statement here. The New Testament restrict, text restricts itself or, uh, what is considered authoritative to itself it doesn't allow things that contradict it or things that could be added to it by any means room to speak it's just it is the authority that's that's the point here so 1 John 1 John 4 beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the spirit of God Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming in the world, and now already is in the world. So, I think we'll stop there. It's the idea that there's no other uh, spirit or word or letter 
uh, that it's allowed um, to be authoritative. Only the gospel that's written in the New Testament is true. Only the Jesus portrayed in the New Testament is true. And any aberrations are not allowed, not permitted by the New Testament itself. So, I think that is enough of that. But what do we do with how the New Testament would talk about prophecy? Because prophecy is um, bringing forth the word of God. Um, in the traditional sense, the prophet, certainly in Hebrew, the prophet is basically a spokesperson for someone else. Um, the word is not just used of people speaking for God. In fact, Aaron in uh, Exodus, who is the spokesperson who does the speaking for Moses, because Moses had some type of speech issue. His tongue was heavy, uh, or his mouth was heavy. I think his tongue was heavy. It's, con it's called the prophet. God actually says to Moses, Aaron will be your prophet, and you will be to him as God, or you'll be God to him. So you'll be the source, Aaron will be the speaker. That's the idea of the, of the prophet, at least in the Old Testament word, which is Nevi'im. And I don't really think that's important, but that's the word for prophets. And um, I don't know Greek, I never really studied it, but prophets show up in, in the New Testament doing similar things. M many have argued that, uh, some at least have argued that New Testament prophets and New Testament prophecy is inherently different than Old Testament prophecy, and so rules or restrictions or understandings of Old Testament prophecy shouldn't apply to New Testament prophecy. Some have argued that uh, how prophet being, bringing God's word, being God's mouthpiece to proclaim what God is, God's agenda, what God's saying, means that um, prophet in the New Testament is really just someone who's preaching the scripture, or prophet in the church today would be someone who's preaching God's written word or the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. Um, others have pointed out how uh, there's a separate you know category in the New Testament for preaching and teaching the word, so it kind of doesn't make sense to understand it that way. Um, so when you get into this topic, you can get you can fracture into a, a million different, uh, not a million, but several, a few at least different viewpoints. You can get hot, hotly contended, and there's a reason why. Uh, you know that's kind of a hotly contended thing, and it's because there's a lot of warning about false prophecy um, or false prophets in the New Testament. The New Testament has a lot to say, uh, but it, has, it gives warnings. Um, you know, for just uh, for instance, let's look at a few. Um, uh, Matthew, Matthew. Jesus is talking about the end of the world as he knew it his disciples knew it and what does he say he says um, Matthew 24 11 then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and if you jump down to 24 same chapter Matthew 24 for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Uh, Mark, in his gospel, reiterates this same point. Um, uh, if you were to jump earlier in Matthew, you'd see Jesus in a different setting, talking about false prophets. That is uh, Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets who will come in sheep's clothing. Come to you in sheep's clothing. This is 7.15. But in really they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Um, Paul writes about false prophets. 
um, Thessalonians. This is where, where we were, I believe. It's reading earlier. Second Thessalonians. Uh, two. Verse nine. It's not false prophets. This is the, the lawless one. Okay. The coming of the lawless one is in accordance to all the working of Satan all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Um, so that's actually not a mention of prophets, but it's a mention of the kinds of things that are associated with prophets, signs and wonders, uh, but deceptive ones. Um, might not be helpful to look at every reference to a false prophet, but we could just look at name a few. There's uh, in uh, Acts, there's a guy that gets saved, becomes a believer in Acts 13. He's referred to as a false prophet. He was a false prophet. Acts 13, 6. Um, 2 Corinthians 11 is about all about uh, Kind of an argument about um, and well is, is Paul a legitimate prophet um, we read some of that I think just a little while ago but false prophets are mentioned throughout that whole chapter Galatians will mention it Galatians 2 4 talks about false teaching Timothy Paul's talking to Timothy first Timothy 6 20 false doctrine um, second Peter 2 second Peter 4 got some false false prophets false teaching in Revelation 16 19 and 20 mentions this false prophet who also performs lying signs and wonders so if that's not enough uh, instance to, to raise some concern it, 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 it is I'm just gonna say that that that's like over a dozen close to a dozen references to false doctrine false prophets and and there's a real uh, and a warning to watch out for false apostles so there's a legitimate concern uh, for the church to how to handle and interact with prophecy. And, and some churches in, in their interpretive tradition have, have gone the route of uh, canon is closed and, and now we just have the word of God, uh, the Bible, and we're not, there's nothing else. You know, no angels speaking, no spirits, no prophets coming and delivering words and messages. Um, and others have gone, to, to, tried to walk a little bit more precarious route in their interpretive tradition a little bit of a harder thing and that is to allow for prophecy and prophets and, and an attempt to regulate them and the, the prophetic operation by scripture how scripture might uh, put restrictions on it um, that's pretty much the camp I would fall in I think at least at this point I uh, think there's enough evidence enough teaching in scripture about the prophecy and the you and prophets to um, cause you to cause me to think well we have to take this seriously we got to deal with them interact with them why don't we why don't I show you why, you know, the passages that would um, show, cause me to, uh, you know, show us, show me that, you know, there, there are, uh, we're going to have to look at or interact with the prophetic uh, in the modern church. This is passages in the New Testament that hint at that at least. Um, So you have spiritual gift lists or lists of gifts that God has given to the church. We have uh, 
Corinthians. We have Romans 12. We have 1 Corinthians 12 and also 1 Corinthians 14. Um, not every list mentions uh, prophets, I believe. If we were to look very closely, that Romans does it. But I don't know for sure. So let me just turn to Romans 12. Uh, right. So Romans doesn't really mention that. So that's not a passage to consider. But Ro Corinthians 12 and 14 do. You have a list at the beginning of Corinthians 12 where he talks about how God is... is gifting different people or he's he's uh, you he's at work in his church and different people are, are being used in different ways and, and he says you know to um where are we now therefore i make known to you i'm in 12 3 that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are differences of gifts, or diversities of gifts in the same Spirit, diversities of ministries, but the same Lord, diversities of activity, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of idols, to another interpretation of tongues. So you see prophecies listed there. Furthermore, as, as you go down the, the chapter, uh, at the end of this chapter, there seems to be like another list of, maybe they're not gifts, but they're types of things that God has in, in his churches. Uh, 28. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. Then you drop down to 14, and you see... Um, a whole thing about how prophecy is a preferred thing that Paul would rather they were prophesying than speaking in tongues. Um, and there's a lot to be said about how they he wants he, he understands they should they ought to be in their service the Corinthians when they're met, meeting together as the Church of God to be speaking in tongues and, and prophesying and how they're not they're not doing it well or right or, or um, certainly not how how. The Holy Spirit wants, as Paul is is speaking, writing to them, correcting them through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's telling them they need to do it differently. So there's there's regulation given in fourteen how prophecy would happen. Um, another uh, passage out here is um, at the end of. Uh, a little scattered with my notes, but um, that shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone who's watched a previous video of me. Um, I don't really prepare a whole lot, which is a flaw of my own. I mean, I do prepare notes, but I don't prepare. I don't have a script. I don't like I'm reading what I'm saying. I just have all these scriptures written down. But uh, the passage I want to pull out is um, 2 Thessalonians 5, the very end, where you have this instruction um, to not despise prophecy. Okay. 2 Thessalonians, uh, that doesn't make sense because there's only three chapters, so it must be 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench the spirit. 20. Do not despise prophecies. 21. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Good. Abstain from what is evil. 
Um, so that's some passages where you know he's telling them don't don't despise prophecy. Seems like they may have been fed up with it, fed up with trying to regulate it or trying to to um, operate with it in a way that didn't go against scripture because it it, it is you, you can't it doesn't take a, a you know a lot of imagination to see how an operation of a of a gift or a or a kind of role of prophet in the church will kind of has the potential very easily to loggerheads with the concept or the doctrine of, of the scripture being closed nothing to be, can be added to it and uh, you can see the approach that I that is I think is an approach that, that of many churches of the present era where we're just going to kind of do away with prophecy and this I think is what Paul's talking about in second Thessalonians do not despise prophecies I think we may have, as as part of the Church of Jesus Christ, we may have despised prophecies by kind of closing down opportunity for for God to operate in that way in His Church because because it's hard to regulate. Um, now, I want I want to be faithful to the idea that uh, these gifts may have ceased. And, and at some point, they they stopped operating. They were operating in the New Testament era. That's why there's the instruction given to not despise them. That's why there's the instruction given how to um, use them, how to how to how they could be regulated in the church service. But it's, I think it's pretty important to 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 know at least that um, there's there is evidence, and you can build a case biblically that. They have ceased to operate. They, they did cease, um, or they will cease, even. And uh, and that's why maybe we have we don't see them now, but they were there in the time of the New Testament. So maybe two passages to look at, so you can see how that idea is rooted biblically. It doesn't doesn't just come out of thin air. First um, uh, Corinthians thirteen. Uh, where are we? Paul's saw in the middle of this passage on how the Holy Spirit's operating and people in churches are are being used by God to minister to one another. And uh, trying to make the point, Paul is in this section that none of this is any good without love. You have to love each other in order to appropriately be able to minister to one another. Um, uh, verse 8. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 8. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Fail, I think, is interpreted in the sense of stop. Or fall off, fall away, fail, because you know of the context where the prophecies they'll fail, tongues will cease, stop, knowledge it'll vanish away. Um, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put childish things. So, so the argument that could be made here is that there's this coming that which is perfect. When that which is perfect has come, these gifts such as uh, prophecy, tongues, knowledge, which could be understood as word of knowledge from the earlier passage, will no longer be necessary because the perfect has arrived. And and uh, that's if you're gonna if the argument's gonna be pro. pro uh, proposed or put forward that these gifts have in fact ceased today, then the generally the idea is that the establishment of the church is is that that which is perfect 
having some. Um, there, so, of course, there's other understandings as to what that which is perfect might mean. Um, I, I, I think that when I prepared some of these notes a while ago, a year and a half ago, I did a really thorough uh, study on that perfect and tried to break down that uh, word family, tried to break down different meaning senses of it, and I, I had, um, you know, I broke it down to three or four different meaning senses. I don't really remember what they are right now, and I put it in a footnote here, and then I deleted the footnote got deleted, and so the content of the footnote is gone, but the numbers there. So that's I don't know what happened with that, but I remember my conclusion at the time was that it didn't seem to me it didn't seem to me to really matter what the perfect thing actually was because there was enough other evidence around to convince me that regardless of what the meaning of perfect was, it couldn't have meant in this context, or regardless of what are the possibilities of meaning senses for perfect, it couldn't have in this context meant the establishment of the church because it seemed that that uh, um, these gifts were to uh, be used. Well, before I, sh before I share why I, I came to the conclusion that it couldn't mean uh, the establishment of the church in this context, let me just share another passage that that is often used, often from which this idea can spring that you have uh, the beginning of the church and then... Uh, these gifts are these these offices or these op ways of God using people are no longer necessary. So uh, Ephesians two. Um, now therefore, uh, verse nineteen, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. So you have this idea that the uh, Church of God is being built, um, right? And the foundation, well, the, the chief cornerstone, which is the key pivotal stone in the structure, is Jesus. But then the, the other key stone, the foundation, is the apostles and the prophets. So the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ is the key cornerstone, and then the whole building is being built up on top of that. So you can you can see how it's definitely, I would say, a plausible understanding, plausible interpretation to take away from this passage that the apostles and prophets were the foundation of the church. Once the church is founded, you may not need them anymore. Now you have the rest of the church, just like we still don't have Jesus. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We don't. We still don't have Jesus with us here on earth, but he's he's still with us in a, in a different sense because he's everywhere. He's God, right? But so we so also we we like Jesus is not walking the earth like he did at the beginning. The apostles and prophets may not be around like they were at the beginning. That's a very plausible uh, interpretation, and I think understanding the Corinthians passage as that which is perfect, perhaps being the establishment of the church, is, is a little bit less plausible, uh, only because it's, I, don't, I don't really like the idea of understanding knowledge as, as something that, like it's where there are tongues, they, they will cease, where there are prophecies, they will fail, where there is knowledge, it will vanish. I see how you could understand knowledge as one of those gifts, like word of wisdom, word of knowledge that had been mentioned earlier, but it just seems more of a stretch to me to understand it that way. And I just, I'm a little bit less comfortable with that, that reading because um, it seems to me like it could just mean knowledge, period. And we know knowledge isn't gone. So by argument, tongues and prophets wouldn't, wouldn't be gone. Um, but so why did I come to this conclusion that it was kind of irrelevant what perfect meant there, and and why why would I come to the conclusion that what I think is a plausible interpretation of 
Ephesians 2 there, what I just read, might not be the best. And that was the, the purpose that I saw given in the New Testament for things like prophecy or, or any of the spiritual gifts or the, these offices of the church, apostle, prophet, teacher. And, and that was their, their functional uh, purpose. So if you find uh, that uh, part uh, here, where was that? Uh, um, yes, here we are. Um, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, which is another passage on spiritual gifts. There's like, uh, I believe, five good passages on that. The beginning of, well, Romans 12, the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12, the end of 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. So we have Romans 2 and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Ephesians 4, then also in uh, Peter, uh, which I know. But I have it written down here. Uh, I'll pull it up. First uh, Peter four, seven, seven through eleven is what I wrote down. But those are all teaching where, where they're talking about different gifting or, or uses that God has for people. But I wanted to look at the Ephesians four at a purpose of uh, of these. Prophets and Apostles, um, that is, where are we here, really didn't want this to be, video to be about arguing a position uh, on, on the nature of prophecy, but I, I guess it just ended up being, I, I don't, I just question how productive ham, ham, hammering down any kind of sectarian point where where you know there there are reasons to believe a different position you know and, and there's just lots of people in different camps hammering down the one side especially i don't know how productive it is but let's just look and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists this is 411 some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by the cunning craftiness of the deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, well, I, I, it, it goes on. But the idea here is that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, pastors and teachers to the church for a purpose, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body, until we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The bottom line is that the church isn't that, and nor are individual Christians, and nor will we be on this earth. We won't come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. And uh, I think that that's, that's something that's going to happen in eternity. Um, and so if the purpose of God giving the apostles and the prophets, which I understand this Ephesians 4 passage, passage to say, is to to equip the saints until we all come to the full measure of the stature of Christ, then they're, they're, they're still needed. So, so they wouldn't have ceased. That's kind of what, what, what I understood there about apostles and prophets. And then as far as gifts um, of the, or the, the gift of prophecy, it seems that many of the contexts that I saw spiritual gifts in the Bible and I will just uh, signs really, signs and wonders had to do with evangelism um, Mark 3, 14, 15 Mark 6, 7 12 to 13, Mark 16 15 through 18, Acts 14 1 through 3, 
Romans 15, 18 through 20, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6, Hebrews 2, 3 through 4. Those are almost all mentions of some kind of miraculous thing, which I would think it's a spiritual gifts like prophecy and tongues and those other things fall into that miraculous type category. Uh, but the thing about all those references I just read off is that it's uh, they're all linking they're all linked to evangelism. And since since evangelism is something that we're still in the business of, it's our purpose as a church preaching the gospel in all the world, it would stand to reason that the gifts are still necessary. So that's a little bit of my own personal understanding. It's not really my, not really my purpose here. But, you know, when you don't make a good plan about what you're going to talk about, you basically end up rambling. So last 10 minutes here, I just want to uh, look at maybe a handful of tests or, or restrictions, restraints that... Um, the Bible puts on the operation of the prophetic gift, uh, gifting. So, uh, let's look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter 18. This is Moses speaking. This is early on. Now, I realize that uh, there's a lot of ways of understanding the Bible where by um, different sections of the Bible would be understood to be um, you know, no longer applying and, and things like that. I, I, I don't really hear to those kind of positions. So that's why I'm reading to you from Deuteronomy. I'll also just point out that Deuteronomy is the most frequent book that Jesus quoted from. Um, so Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And if you jump up one verse before where I started reading, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So there's a kind of high uh, restraint on uh, speaking falsely not speaking in the, in the name of the Lord. So how would we, we test prophecy? Here's a test given by Moses to the children of Israel. If the prophet speaks and the things he says don't happen, or they're not true, they don't pan out as true, uh, that's a false prophet. He's not speaking in the name of the Lord. That's a test. Um, Jesus gives a, a test we read from earlier in Matthew 7. That is a, a fruit you show. So we got Moses' test about um, what's prophesied doesn't come to pass. Deuteronomy 18. That's a false prophecy. Um, Jesus. So why am I giving tests anyways? Uh, the passage we read from the end of 1 Thessalonians 5. Despise not prophecy. Test all things. We're, we're, it's a command to the church to test prophecy. Don't despise it, but test it. So we're gonna we're commanded to test it. Uh, the same command comes up in, in 1 John 4, which I read earlier. You know, test the spirits. We're, we're commanded to 1 John 4, 1 through 3. We were, we were reading when we were talking about the closed can test the spirits to come well we have to if we're commanded to test we have, we as the church have a responsibility to know how to test so that's why i brought up deuteronomy 18 we test by the word that is spoken whether or not it comes to pass uh, we test by the, the um, character of that prophet or the fruit of his life uh, matthew 7 you shall know them by their fruits, is the heading in my Bible. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 
you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. I don't know how else we would we would uh, gauge what their fruit is other than looking at their life, their character, and perhaps those they are discipling, what's coming of their ministry. But uh, so that's Jesus. Moses says, if it doesn't come to pass, Jesus says, look at the fruit of the prophet. And I, I, I uh, propose that the fruit is their, their life style, their behavior, and what's their, their follow that of their followers. Um, there's two. Here's a, here is a third. Paul talks about it being confirmed by what has been revealed to others. So if I have a prophetic word from the Lord and I want to test it, I can confirm it by what has been revealed to other prophets. Paul actually does this. Um, he models this in Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 12. Um, verse 12 at least. Galatians. Galatians is in here somewhere. Okay, Galatians 1, uh, 12. So he's talking about the gospel that he had received from by revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, for I neither received it, that's the gospel from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he, he models how he went and got this revelation, but then he actually goes and he tests it. Verse, verse uh, jumping forward to the next chapter, to the second verse, chapter 2, verse 2. And I went up. He's talking, went up means he's going to Jerusalem. It's an idiom that means going to Jerusalem. So when you just under, you know that that's what it means because Jerusalem's one of the highest points in the area. So you have to go up to get there. I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. He's talking about the other apostles, uh, Peter, Jesus' brother, James. He's communicating there that the revelation he'd received to them to to see that it's accurate because he wants to know whether he, what he's, he's doing something wrong he not only models this idea he, he commands it or he teaches that it should be done when he's in that passage in in first Corinthians where I pointed out that, that it was all about um, first Corinthians 14 where there's all kinds of you know, the whole passage is kind of dedicated to instruction about how to use the gifts of tongues and prophecy, really comparing and contrasting the two gifts and talking, speaking the phrases of prophecy. If you look at verse 29 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, um, it says, let two or three prophets speak, this is at, at, at a time in a church service, and let the others judge. So the others, prophets, are judging what the one prophet is speaking, is commanding prophets to so to judge or to test what the other prophets tested against what's been revealed to other prophets. So we got Moses, does it come true? Jesus, what about their fruit? Paul, what do the other prophets say about what this prophet says? These are three texts and there's there's more. Um, there is uh, the command to look at prophecy against scripture or against the orthodox doctrines of the faith, against what we know to be true. How does this relate to the canon, as it were? So Moses taught, taught about this. If you go back to Numbers, you'll see Moses speaking on this topic, uh, Numbers 13. Look, take a gander at it. One through 
54. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, these are the kind of things that are associated with prophets, signs and wonders, and that sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. So what's happening? He's performing signs and wonders. The kind, the very kind of thing that, that uh, good prophets of the Lord do. But, and accompanied with his signs and wonders, he's preaching unorthodox things. He's telling them to do the exact opposite of what the law, the Torah, the rest of Deuteronomy says to do, and that is worship the Lord your God and him only, one God. He's saying, go worship other gods, not the Lord. So this is this, this idea of orthodoxy. Um, the passage that I read um, from Galatians, where the revelation is contrary to the gospel that they've already received, it's another example of this. If, you have revel if the revelation from the prophet speaks contrary to the canon of scripture, you reject the prophet and you receive the canon of scripture. Um, believers are commended for this kind of thing. Um, you have Acts 17, for example. You have uh, uh, the church in, in uh, I think they're in uh, they're the Berean Christians where they, uh, they listen to what Paul says, but then they check what he's saying. Um, these Berean Christians were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find whether these things were so. So they're checking Paul's preaching against the Torah. And they, and they found the validity of everything Paul was saying in this New Testament message in the Old Testament. Um, this is same thing when Paul is giving a farewell address to the Ephesian elders. He says, you know, um, you're going to have to test uh, people who claim that they're, they're uh, let's just read it, they're, they're uh, apostles or prophets. And so. so Ephesians, or Acts 20, 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will arise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember. For three, for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone, day and night, with tears. If you follow this story forward, you'll see that um, there were false teachers in the Ephesian church that Paul even had exercised church discipline against. You see that in Timothy. Timothy, the letters from Paul's writing, Timothy, Timothy's at, in Ephesus. And I think it's Hymenes and Alexander. Paul's mentioning their, their false teaching. But then Jesus speaks to the church the Ephesian church in uh, Revelation chapter 2. I believe it's verse 2. I'm not in the right spot. And he says, what does he say? I know your works and your patience, your labor, that you cannot stand you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So I guess this isn't um, prophets, it's apostles. So that, that Ephesian example is apostles, not prophets, but similar to the passage about the Bereans and the passage in, in Deuteronomy. Also the, the one in, in John where if the spirit that I read... 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Let's just read it again. Uh, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets, so this one specifically mentions false prophets, many false prophets are gone out into the world. By this you shall know 
the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and now is already in the world. This is a, a, a litmus test for, for the validity of the prophet, his, his orthodoxy to the doctrines of the New Testament, the deity of Christ, which is, which is a doctrine that's a teaching that's taught in the scripture. So, so we're commanded to, to not despise prophecy, but instead to test all, all, all things, not just what prophets are uttering, but everything we should recommend to test. And how do we test prophecy? We have a test from Moses talking about Deuteronomy 18, whether or not it comes true. We have a test that uh, Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7 about uh, the fruit, um, as in their character and their followers' character and what, what's being produced in their followers um, or their disciples. We have uh, testing them against what other prophets have been revealed or having other prophets judge it, those who operate in the same type of gifting, and testing it um, by how well it conforms to the scriptures, the, um, the truths in the scriptures. So there's, there's four tests for prophecy, and we are commanded to test it, and we're also commanded not to despise it. Now, I understand that this is, you, you, you need to understand as a listener, if you're listening to this, this is one uh, position on this. This is a position that would maintain that these types of gifts still have a place in the current modern day church. There are other positions which understand that those gifts have ceased to be a part of modern day church life. And those positions are not um, you know, bizarrely um, crazy. They actually arise from scripture, much like this position um, that I tried to portray in this video arises from scripture um, and there's just some some nuances in how how you understand the passage or what you consider to be the thrust or the intent of the passage or maybe what you consider to be most plausible from what the passage is, is teaching and uh, <clears throat> I obviously since I'm teaching this position, believe this is the most plausible uh, position um, from what the scriptures are teaching and taken as a whole, how much they're mentioning prophecy and, and regulating it, and then the purpose. Really, I think that was the thing that really I find most convincing is the purposes given for prophet. And it seems to be connected with evangelism pretty heavily. I listed a lot of passages where it is, and it's for edifying or building up the, the body to the fullness of Christ and we still are in the need to evangelize and we're still in the need of maturing ourselves as a, a church to grow up to be the image of Christ so given that purpose I just find this to be the, the most probable uh, of multiple plausible understandings of the gift of prophecy um, I guess I should just stop talking. Yeah, I, I just stopped. So that's basically it. Um, lots of um, teaching on uh, how this stuff can be misused and how to appropriately use it. Um, Corinthians uh, is a big one. Corinthians 14. Yeah, just gotta, just gotta stop talking, you know. Sometimes you just gotta shut the jaw. So thank you for listening. Let's just pray. Abba Father, if uh, anybody listens to this video and it, and it, it is helpful to them, Lord God, I, I pray that as they're listening, your spirit would speak to their heart, speak to their minds. You'd bring clarity of the truth of your word. You would convict 
and you would um, your word would cut through piercing the heart and Lord God that you would um, not let your word come back without accomplishing things in the hearts of people in our hearts so we love you Lord we thank you for who you are in Jesus' name